Hey everybody, so today is going to be a little different than our typical videos. So I am actually going to go onto LinkedIn and I am going to be searching for a job, a job for me, a job for you. So if you are not familiar with how to do a search for the different titles, there are a lot of them, and different characteristics for information architecture jobs, I thought this would be helpful for anybody that is currently looking for a job in this space. So with that, let's go get started. Okay, so we are on LinkedIn. This is the first place that I would start. And I'm not gonna start maybe exactly where you think I'm gonna start. So instead of just going directly here to jobs, what I'm going to do instead is I'm gonna to go to my network. So I'm gonna to go to my network and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to go to my connections here and I'm going to start looking through the different titles that everybody has. So all of these titles are something that I can use to understand what to call whatever I do. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of different titles for what we do. So this allows you to go through and kind of get a feel for how other people are describing themselves. So let's go over to jobs. So here I am going to start my search by title. So let's start with the most obvious. So it'll give you some automated suggestions. So you'll hear, you'll see here data architect. So first of all, these are promoted. So, you know, be aware that anything that's promoted is something that is being paid to get uh, shot to the top of the list. So a data architect, this is something that I've seen popping up more recently, a metadata architect, uh, data wrangler, um, those types of titles. So let's go ahead and look over here. So this one is, looks like senior design manager for financial tech. Now, one thing to keep in mind, as you see the titles, this one is specifically talking about AWS, Amazon Web Service, but it's talking about this for the judge group. So that means that you need to know one platform really well, AWS. If you don't have experience with AWS, there are free trainings um, and, and some other things that you can get experience on AWS. But, you know, ultimately, if you're being asked to be um, a data architect on AWS, you've got to be really good with AWS. You can see one for Apple, there's a data architect. So one thing I would caution is when you're looking at getting a new job or getting your first job uh, as your career, don't get fooled by the big names. So Amazon will eat you alive. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of taxonomists that have gone through the Amazon process. And while it's not necessarily a bad experience, it is a lot. And if you've never worked in a professional you know, office before, and because we're all working from home right now, it, it could be a little tricky. Um, the other thing I would say is some of these bigger companies have that, you know, sex appeal where uh, they're, it's sexy. I go and I talk to my grandma and I'm like, yeah, I work for Google or yeah, I work for Apple. Yeah, that's really cool. But also a lot of those companies use their own proprietary systems. So what that means is if you're working at Google and I know this for a fact, um, you might not know how to use all the other taxonomy management tools in the, in, in the industry because Google has their own proprietary one. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but also keep in mind, if you're trying to grow your career, if you don't feel like you're going to work at Google for the rest of your life, which most people, because it's tech, that work at Google cycle through every five to 10 years, 10 is a lot, so maybe like five years, if not less, um, that is something to keep in mind. You're not going to grow your skill set as much as you would like. That's the other thing I just mentioned is, I can't say this for all big tech companies. It's it's often considered not a good thing if you stay in the job that you have at companies like that for more than two years, because it's almost felt like you need to be constantly growing, constantly doing more and, and progressing. And if you don't, um, it doesn't always look good. Okay, not a blanket statement, but just keep in mind, if you want fast paced, go, 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 lots of pressure, do more things, do some really cool things with really cool data, um, you don't always have to go to the big companies for that. In fact, I would actually say 
working at some of the smaller companies, even startups, you know what? It's a wild west out there. They are doing all kinds of crazy things. And if you really want to experiment and you really want to stretch your wings and, you know, carpe diem, do whatever, um, to do some really um, amazing work without a lot of overhead of um, startups and smaller companies are actually going to give you more wiggle room to do that. All right, so let's keep looking. Lead information and data architect. So I think we got data architect. Data architect might be the one to, to, to search on. Let's see. More data architect. The other thing is I will say is um, data architect is a pretty big term. Enterprise architect. So anytime architect is described, it sometimes means engineer, meaning somebody with a computer science background, somebody with maybe even higher degrees, while other times a data architect could be somebody that really just is, is, is the data wrangler, the person that's going to be working with the analytics, the person that is going to need skill sets like uh, SQL or SQL or something of that nature, understanding the, the basics of uh, databases and database design, while other times it could be making, you know, the schema and, and doing more of the knowledge modeling. So let's just look a little bit more. We've got senior software architect. So again, it's, it's going between data architect and architects on like the enterprise level. So let's just look at the difference between the two. Okay. So this one is improving UX based on needs, doing wireframe prototypes, workflow, agile. There's a key word. So agile methodologies, this is essentially breaking up all of the design work, all the work that you do into bite-sized chunks. And those chunks are as follows. In general, it's a good practice to know. That's not a good sign. If you don't see a lot of um, what are they expecting of the applicant, probably not a good one to look at. So let's go past these promoted ones. So let's look at Apple, Data Architect. Okay, this is much better. You see there's a summary, key qualifications. This is better. I, I really would stay away from jobs that we just looked at that don't have a lot of criteria. Because that means they don't know what they're looking for or they're shady, just saying. All right, so key qualifications. Experience working with large data sets. Okay, when it says large data sets, it doesn't mean big data, everything's big data. It could just mean that you need to, be, you need to have something outside of the lab. So if you are a new student, or if you're just somebody coming into this career, you know, having experience with larger data sets, doesn't mean that you have to be working with, you know, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes. That said, also keep in mind, you don't need to say your experience is paid experience. What does that mean? It means if you are on the job and you don't have the capability or you're not given the, the leeway to work with larger data sets, go get an internship, go, go, you know, pound the pavement, go, go call some of these companies up and say, hey, I have these skills and I want to help you. You have cool data. Would you be willing to sign, sign on with me for little to no money and let me experiment? And in a safe, controlled atmosphere, which means you wouldn't be a security risk and play with the data. That's how you get experience. All right, experience creating reusable, scalable architecture. Okay, that's great. So. Reusable, interoperable, knowledge graph, not always knowledge graph, but that making sure that you're not making a snowflake. So you know how snowflakes, every single one is different and unique. You don't want that in a tech company because that means you have a lot of what's called technical debt. You don't want a lot of technical debt because you're going to be spending your time trying to maintain and fix bubble gum and duct tape things Whereas you would really want to start moving yourself forward and getting more experience and doing more things for your company. Experience visualizing key information with data sets. Okay, so this is 
um, data storytelling. This is a very, I think, very important skill set to have. Um, I have often had people show me decks where they're like, this is, look at all these cool analytics. And I say, awesome. What does it mean? Now, I can look at it and figure it out because I, I know how to read data. But if you're telling me that the, the numbers in, in quarter two went down and the numbers in quarter four went up and in the interim, there were um, two, two big marketing campaigns. Okay, well, is, is there any causality in that? Is there any kind of insight that you can gain from that? Telling the story is not just showing the visuals and not just telling the, the stakeholders what the data is saying, it's what is the story? Telling a story through data is, I think, one of the most critical and often overlooked skill sets. So if you can do that, I bet you're gonna be looking at some pretty good jobs out there. Okay, ability to parse. Parse is, is a key word here. Complex, ambiguous data sets into clear data models. Okay, so we know what a data model is. Those are schema, those are ontologies, those are knowledge graphs. There's a lot of other kinds of, um, there's a lot of other kinds of uh, modeling out there. So being able to pick the right data set with the right model and being able to parse it. So parse usually means doing some kind of machine learning and or being able to use some other um, query language to get at that information. So as we've been talking about ontologies and knowledge graphs, you've noticed me talking about insights. How do you get you know, smart insights? How do you get more um, explicit information um, to tell you those implicit connections? That is what this is talking about. All right. Collaboration, of course, when it's saying dynamic and diverse. So usually what that means is you're going to be working with a lot of different departments, a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds and most likely all across the globe. So make sure that you play well with others is always positive. Passion for high quality deliverables, absolutely. So, you know, do you have drive? Do you actually wanna do what you're doing? Um, I have often been told in my job interviews that people can hear the passion um, in my voice and the way that I describe things. Do you have to act super animated like, like I am all the time? This is me naturally, by the way. <laughs> if you know me in person, you know this is how I am. Uh, no, that doesn't mean you have to be that way. But, you know, let your passion show. Don't, don't go into a job interview being so stiff and formal that they're not going to get a, a, a glimpse of your personality. Because here's the thing, today HR dictates that you are not supposed to ask a lot of personal information of your candidates because you want to make sure that you are assessing everyone equally across the same criteria. This is very common. Like when you go and you do um, an interview with Amazon, I've done a few, they have very, like they actually do coaching with you before you go on your interview to prepare you for these are the exact kinds of questions that we're going to be asking you. And every person that you go into an interview with will have like a set number of things that they're trying to, to understand about you. So because you have to be very structured as the person interviewing, you know, as you're answering your questions, I'm not saying pepper in that you have a dog and, and you like rock climbing in your in your answers. Don't, you know, don't force that sort of thing in. But let your experiences and, and the things that you love about this space shine through because that's that's gonna really win you a lot of jobs over, you know, other candidates that might be equally as qualified as you because people can tell you're like on fire for this. Whereas another person might it might be hard to understand how they're gonna like something like this. Okay, so this is talking about more um, data models, building at scale. At scale is really important. So I find this a lot with machine learning um, people that, that come right out of school, where you can build these really beautiful data models and you can do all kinds of cool machine learning on a teeny tiny data set or a lab data set, something that's not really going to be um, representative of the real world. So be careful about that. Doing something at scale means that you can do it in a controlled environment and out in live. 
So that, that's what at scale means and making sure that you can do it not just at that smaller scale, but on the, the true volume that Apple would be, would be using. Um, oh, okay, create visualizations. I love this, I actually love this one. So this is talking about a lot of visualizations. I think that the, the strongest story that you can tell with data is through visuals because you don't necessarily need to know if something is good or bad, you can color code it. Um, also keep in mind when you're doing color coding, um, people are colorblind too. So you need to make sure that you account for that. Um, but you also have to be very careful when you're doing data visualizations on um, not misconstruing the data. I'm gonna have a whole video on that later, but again, this is pretty cool. Okay, education, a BS or an MS. So when it says or equivalent, don't let this, this education experience line deter you. When it says equivalent, it's because there's so many different disciplines that are doing data science and information science. So if you don't think that you are qualified for this because you don't have a bachelor's or a master's of science, that's okay. I would be, I could, I could apply for this and I don't, I don't have either of those. I have um, a PhD in advanced semantics. I don't see that listed. Does that mean I can't do this? No, that does not mean that. Uh, or computer science or data engineering or data science. So these are all buzzy words. So um, don't worry too much about data science and data engineering being in these descriptions. Data science is usually something that is a blanket statement. Any, th this is a good moment to say, any job description that says data scientist, take it with a grain of salt. Usually when people put data scientist as a job title, it means that they don't really know what they want. Data science is a lot of different things. In fact, um, I will put it up on the screen at the end of this video. There is this fantastic visual on what does data science mean from a skill sets perspective? Suffice it to say, there's a lot of different types of data science, just like there's a lot of different types of computer science. So would you say if you're a computer scientist, you would know Java, C Sharp, C++, Ruby, Ruby on Rails, Python? Like, no, it doesn't mean you know all of those things. So same goes with data science, it's, it's no different. Okay, additional requirements. Five years experience with large scale uh, distributed ETL or ELT. So ELT, extract, load, transform, or um, ETL, extract, transform, load. So the difference between those two is um, one is a data lake, one is not. Uh, if you don't know what a data lake, literally just Google it. It's, it's easy to understand what it is. It's basically just a big old swimming pool of, of all the data and then you uh, transform it after it's been sitting there. So um, this is really important when you are processing data, when you suck up data from something, whether it's the web or different databases or different systems, you have to process it. You have to process it into your schema, into your model, do quality checks on it, do normalization on it. There's a whole lot of massaging going on. And this is a really key part of being an information scientist. It's not all modeling and dealing with really fun data sets. It's a lot of it's messy. A lot of it is, you know, massaging and, and understanding what do you need to focus on and what you can just set aside for now, you know, prioritizing what you're working on. Um, so ETL is a big part of a pipeline process. So what is a pipeline? A pipeline, again, is when you ingest from something and then you transform it into putting it into a database, a data lake, some kind of application. There's, a, there's something that is using the data and, and then you're spitting it out into applications of some sort. Uh, experience with big data tools. So Presto, Spark, Kafka, Hadoop, all of those. So that doesn't mean you have to have experience in all of them. That means you um, can have experience in one of them and understand why that one is different than the others. Most likely what this means is Apple is probably using one of these or they're using a completely different one that's homegrown. And they just wanna make sure that you understand how to use those kinds of tools. Uh, again, big data tools are how do you like wrestle all that data and 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 work with it in a proficient way.
uh, databases like Postgres and Cassandra. Again, these are types of databases. Experience with data pipelines and workflow management tools like Airflow. So data pipeline workflow management tools. So there's actually a lot of them on AWS. I am more familiar with those, but it's essentially like when you have a workflow and you've got a pipeline and there's like stops, it's just like, think of a subway, right? So when you are looking at the subway line, there's different stops on that subway line. If something, you know, got on the tracks at one of those su subway stations, you would get delayed and you wouldn't get to your destination. So what these workflow management tools do is it tells you, it monitors when things are working well and when things are not working well, what went wrong. I know I'm doing a very quick and dirty job of explaining all of these, but that's not the purpose of this video. So bear with me. I will have more videos on those other things. And if you don't want to wait for them, you can always Google it. Uh, experience with object oriented programming. Aha, there we go. So Python, Java. So does that mean you need all of them? No, because it's object oriented, which means if you understand the principles of one, you can figure out the others. Okay, so this one is a really good one for a more um, data centric kind of job. But let's say you want to just do more on the modeling side. So let's go check that out. So let's do uh, <laughs> this one's gonna be funny. Knowledge, specialist knowledge engineer. Okay, so let's look at this one from Spotify. I'm a fan of Spotify. All right, so so a security engineer on the fraud team. So this is an application of knowledge graphs that we haven't talked about too much yet. It is, again, we're using those rules where identify what does fraud mean? What are some of the warning signs? And then based on that, that web, it kind of feels in your data when things are like, hey, something's going on over here. You better go check it out. Um, so pretty cool way of, of using knowledge graph. So what you'll do, this one is being very specific with what kind of subject matter you should be familiar with. This is very common in knowledge uh, modeling because you have to understand that discipline and domain that you're modeling. So here it's talking about security, uh, design and implement systems for detecting abusive behavior, so bad actors, provide security guidance, understand use cases for artificial streaming, content manipulation, and account abuse. So this one is, is, it looks like it's specifically looking at bots. So that is most likely what's happening. Here's another thing. If you are somebody that already has a job and you're watching this, I think you probably already know this, but if you don't, a good way to understand the new technology and the new things that companies are working on or problems that they're trying to solve, the best way to do that is go and look at their job descriptions. Because if they have a security problem, as a lot, of, I'm not pointing that out with Spotify, a lot of places have security problems, um, or they're trying to be very aware that security problems are a high risk, so they're looking for someone. So this actually makes me feel good that they are looking for somebody for security. But let's say a company that you are in competition with has a job opening for a machine learning specialist. Guess what? They're now doing machine learning. Did you know that? Do you have machine learning? It's a good way to go find out what kind of machine learning they're doing. So you can do some competitive intelligence with job descriptions. Three plus years of software engineer experience. So if you have two and a half years, does that mean not apply? No, apply. Three plus years of security and engineering. Well, what if you only have two years? Still apply. So there are some HR um, hiring manager kind of people that they will go through and they will look at that criteria and say, oh, you didn't meet three year qualification. But here's the thing, if you don't have those three years of, of um, experience, but maybe you were in those two years, the number one security analyst of the US government. Well, that's important. That's pretty impressive. When another person maybe has five years experience being the security analyst at their local staples. See what I mean? So if you do fall short in any of the criteria that you're seeing in a job description, flip the switch, you know, make sure that you can shore up why you're still the better candidate. If you have good experience and you have really amazing things that you've done, but you don't have three years experience, 
don't let that deter you. Believe me, when people are looking at your resume, they look at the full resume. And if you've got some cool stuff, but you don't meet that that year criteria, make sure that stuff is at the top of the resume so that they can see that first so you don't get disqualified because of this kind of thing. Um, all right, so this again is a more technical one. Let me go and check out. Let's look at taxonomy. Okay, so taxonomist, we're not gonna look at promoted. Okay, here we go. Global lead product service taxonomy at Google. All right, so bachelor's or equivalent practical experience. Thank you, Google. So practical experience, I love when I see this because it means they care about your life experiences and just because you don't have a degree, there's a lot of tech that you can learn on your own and learn through apprenticeship, going and working with other people, doing internships, just working for free on cool stuff. Um, so you shouldn't be you know, excluded because you don't have a degree in something. Set the vision and strategy for the ads taxonomy. Okay, to provide the correct data while being cost efficient, own and manage the daily ads taxonomy. Okay, so this one tells me that you are going to most likely be connected and working with a lot of different um, departments, but you are going to be a one person army. When it says own and manage, Work with Google's infrastructure team and product managers to improve tools and processes. So yeah, this seems like you're gonna be the one person army. That's not abnormal in taxonomy. In fact, many jobs have I been the one woman army working on some of these things. And then I kind of have like offshoots of people all across the company that I work with. Um, that's very common for taxonomy. So here's another one, business analyst. This is one that I would say also analyst is also a data wrangler kind of person. So as you can see, these taxonomy ones are kind of slim on what they're looking for. And that's most likely because um, people don't really know exactly what they're looking for in a taxonomist. And they don't usually understand the difference between a taxonomist and an ontologist. So like this one, experience working on catalogs at a technology company is recommended. So. Here, if you are somebody from the library world, catalogs mean something very different than this one. This one is talking about um, corp, it's a, it's a corpus of, of cat, that's the catalog here, it's like your product catalog. Okay, so I mentioned ontology and taxonomy, so let's go look at ontology. Ontology. Okay, so you can see here again, um, data and analytics. Fusion lead, data architect again, taxonomist. So you can see there's not a lot of stuff that says ontology specifically. So you'll notice when I type in ontology, we're seeing still things about taxonomy, and we're also seeing things about technical manager, data manager, data architect, knowledge engineer, data scientist and machine learning, so you can see when somebody types in ontology, they don't know what they mean. Um, or I should say, they don't know what to call the, the, the person that they are trying to hire. So if you are an expert in ontology, start searching for a lot of these different words. Also look at the words that they're using in the actual description. So if, you know, SQL is something that is common or Python is something that's common, or RDF, try searching for those things because jobs with those kind of criteria would come up. Okay, so I just typed sparkle to see what showed up and we can see data engineer job, lead data engineer for data platforms. Oh, bioinformation is another one that is analytical and modeling, but in the medical space, ontology also is very commonly um, interchangeable with taxonomy in the medical space. Um, I would say that's not probably true for other disciplines, but in the medical space, they definitely um, interchange those a lot. Um, you can see software engineering. So it's not going to, doing a search on the skill sets isn't going to give you the exact job, but it will give you a better understanding of what other jobs are out there for the skills that you actually have. 
So don't be so hung up on the actual job title. Look at the actual skill sets. And then you can go and find what you're looking for. That way you can find more keywords to do searches on. Um, you can, if you're trying to work in a specific company because they're doing really cool things, check out my uh, metadata showdowns for some cool people doing uh, some, for some cool companies doing some cool things. Remote, right now, almost everybody is working remote. So what I would also say here is apply, apply, apply. If you apply for a job on the East Coast and you live on the West Coast, guess what? Everybody's working from home anyways, as long as you're okay with keeping the same hours and be upfront if you get a call back that you do not want to relocate, or maybe you do, uh, just be upfront about that. And don't let it deter you. If, if you are the perfect candidate and they like you, they're gonna make it work. I know this from experience, so take, take my word for it. If they like you, they'll make it work. All right, so those were just a few. So if you have any questions at all, please put them in the comments below. Um, if you find me on LinkedIn, you can ask me directly there. I am trying to help as much as possible. So I really hope that this video um, strikes a good nerve with everyone and helps you find the perfect job of your dreams. That's all I can hope for. So with that, thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.